Welcome to Back to the Roots Podcast. I'm Brian Wood, and in this episode, Mike Klein and I had the chance to sit down with Wes Jackson and David Klein. Wes is the founder and former president of the Land Institute, which has led research on discovering perennial grains. David is a retired organic dairy farmer and an author. Both Wes and David are influential members of the sustainable agriculture community, and in this conversation we covered a lot of interesting topics. Talking to these two was a real privilege, and we hope you enjoy. Thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, along with Brian Wood, myself, Mike Klein, we are joined by Wes Jackson and uh, David Klein. Uh, if you know anything about agriculture or environmental issues, then you'll recognize the name Wes Jackson. Uh, Wes is an author, researcher, and founder of the Kansas-based Land Institute, which since 1976 has led America American research into the natural systems agriculture, a method of farming that uses perennial grains to help build soil and help create a natural balance and sustainability without chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Uh, the, far, the farming methods that Wes and the Land Institute have developed are used around the world. And David Klein has been farming since 1968, although he's semi-retired now. Uh, He's still involved in helping on his daughter and son-in-law's family farm, a 120-acre dairy farm in central Ohio. He has written four books with the most recent one. Uh, it's called Round of a Country Year, a Farmer's Day book, with a preface by Wendell Berry will be released in mid-August. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. Really looking forward to our conversation. Yeah. So, Wes, if you could... Uh, just start out a little bit with the history of the Land Institute and where that all started. Hmm. Well, in 1976, um, I retired uh, as a um, from my position in California State University in Sacramento uh, to start the Land Institute, which we said devoted to a search for sustainable alternatives in agriculture energy, shelter, waste management, and so on. Uh, wasn't long after that that we, um, I had been reading the General Accounting Office study on how well the, so the money was being spent by the Soil Conservation Service, and it uh, looked to me like uh, soil erosion was as bad in 1977 is when the Soil Conservation Service had been formed back in the 1930s. And I thought, how can this be? You know, thousands of miles, terraces, grass waterways, and so on. And I took my students uh, to, um, on a field trip to the Kanza Prairie. And I uh, had a nice field trip conducted by a good ecologist. And I came back with both that prairie in mind and that study. And um, I know I was thinking that prairie doesn't have soil erosion. <laughs> that prairie doesn't have any fossil fuel inputs. Uh, the Industrial Revolution is represented there only by the barbed wire. Uh, the prairie has no um, alien chemicals being put into the system. And uh, so what's the difference? Because uh, here's our soybean and our corn and our sorghum and so on. And, uh, well, the prairie features perennials grown in mixtures, and our agriculture uh, is annuals that are grown in monocultures. And so that's sort of what set me off. And uh, I wondered why we did not have perennial grains. And uh, so I contacted some of my friends that were knowledgeable folks, and they said, well, it's impossible. But uh, they couldn't tell why. And I said, well, well they'd, they'd say things like, well, uh, a plant will either allocate its resources to the root or to the seeds, but it can't do both. And uh, <clears throat> there's a famous formula uh, that is associated with that that got started looking at clutch size in birds. Birds that have small clutches take very good care of their young. With big clutches, they don't take very good care of their young. And so 
mice are what they call R selected elephants, case selected. So, and so plant people started looking into it, and you know, be careful what you seek, for you will surely find. And they found examples of this trade-off. But I kept asking, well, what about fruit trees? Because they have high yields, and they also are perennial. Well, somehow they were supposed to be in a different category. So we set ourselves the task to, um, uh, well, I published a paper. Uh, uh, the paper came out in 78 uh, that um, to look at the history of earth abuse through agriculture going back 10,000 years. And then um, um, looked like the history of civilization was soil erosion with uh, annual grains. And so we set ourselves the task to perennialize the major crops as well as domesticate some wild species. And, um, uh, and I said that when I wrote it up, I said this is going to take 50 to 100 years. And so now we have the first uh, species, our Kernza, which is still a lot long ways to go, but at least it's out there now. 38 different sites and uh, represents the first new grain in uh, 4,200 years and uh, the first perennial grain ever. So uh, now we're doing a global inventory from the tropics to the temperate zone because three of our guys, three of our scientists, have figured out why our ancestors did not develop perennial grains and why we can now. And so that's sort of a big leap for us. There's so, a, so they figured out why they did not use yeah. perennials. What was, what was their answer? Uh, well, the story gets a little bit complicated, but annuals tend to self accept their own pollen. Now, that's the tightest form of inbreeding, self times self. So if there's a mutant that arises that's lethal or deleterious, it can be eliminated. If there's a desirable trait like resistance for the seed to shatter, which is what it was with wheat and, well, all the annual crops, they have to satter, um, solve the shatter problem because wild species like to shatter. Uh, so... Um, uh, that a gene can get quickly fixed. Perennials tend to outcross. And so as a consequence, uh, if a mutation arises, it can be covered by a normal gene. And um, so it um, would take a long time to eliminate it. In fact, it may be, well, humans are outcrossers and we got a genetic load that we are carrying. And that's one reason we we don't have incest, <laughs> you know. That's to avoid uh, that genetic load. <clears throat> so our guys discovered that it was a genetic load problem, a mutational load problem, and we now know how to purge that genetic load, get rid of it. Uh, partly because of our modern computational power, and partly because uh, we got a better understanding of the genome and uh, that we can actually reduce the number of crosses that we have to make. But, uh, you know, if we were at the eastern end of the Mediterranean 5,000 years ago and we saw giant uh, intermediate wheat grass, which is what Kernza is, and uh, we'd think, boy, that looks like that has promise. We plant the seeds out uh, from you know, pull them off of a plant that looks like it has promise. You plant them out, and they're all half sibs. So if you try to start crossing the big ones out of those half sibs, you're going to have your po population will crash. You know, so there'll be a lot of aborted embryos and so on. So uh, we know how to purge that load. And our ancestors, uh, I think it was tried hundreds of times over a 10,000 year period of humans trying to get perennial grains. Because uh, the condemnation in the uh, Genesis version uh, um, 
for the fall is thistles and thorns and sweat of the brow. And uh, so most of what humans have done in agriculture, if you take the biggest slice of a pie that you cut up and look at human activity, uh, Tim Cruz, our ecologist, has come up with this. Mostly what we do is weed. Humans are primarily weeders as the biggest thing. Well, uh, now with the perennials and to put them in mixtures, if we stop with perennial monocultures, we've missed half the point. So it's the perennial polyculture that we want to get the uh, processes of the wild in the prairie to come to the farm. At this point, uh, how many years would a planting of Kernza last? Do you have to replant eventually? Well, we don't know. Uh, what we do know is those prairies have been there a long time. And uh, we just harvested a seven-year-old patch of Kernza, 20 acres. Uh, uh, and it, it, that's a monoculture, but it's very weed-free you know, because nothing can compete with it, or doesn't compete very well with it. So we don't know. Um, uh, we'll just have to, we'll have to see, and especially when you start putting species together, as we're now doing, we just, we hired a legume breeder. We got to get the legume in there. It, it one here's the way we th think about it, or at least I do. Um, wh wherever you have prairie, whether it's the Canadian provinces, the short grass prairie, or mid grass prairie, or tall grass, there are four functional groups warm season grasses, cool season grasses, legumes, members of the sunflower family. So, our idea is to have representatives of each of those functional groups in our domestic uh, prairie. And if once you get that managed, and I think it'll be managed with fire and grazing. Once you get that managed, and I think it'll probably take a century or two for us to get that very well understood, uh, then it's harvest. And of course, if you pull off phosphorus and potassium and so on, you're going to have to put that back on. But mm -hmm. There's actually a Kernza plot on Ohio State's research farm. Just, uh -huh. what would that be, 15 miles north of here? Uh -huh. They have Kerns out this year. Uh -huh. so. Yes, we have people we're collaborating with in different places. and We're also supporting the perennialization of rice in China. And now uh, uh, Joan and I and uh, uh, my grandson, we were in China last year, and, and we were told as we were going along by the, the, the breeder, and there was a nice big valley, and, and he said, you know, in a couple of years there will be thousands of acres here. And that's of rice, and that's paddy rice. We thought we were uh, supporting the upland rice because the upland rice is where they have a lot of erosion. And uh, but they've now extended to the paddy rice as well. And rice is actually the number one crop grown in the entire world. Right? That's the number one crop of the planet, and it's uh, wheat is number one in acreage. Okay. Uh, and then number three crop, one is rice, two is wheat, number three is corn or ZMAs. And, uh, you know, I've been thinking about that just as a mild digression here. You know, um, to the natives, corn was considered a gift of the gods, but corn has now become primarily the, the killer of the continent, 97 million acres up from 70 million acres. Uh, and uh, well, that and soybeans. <laughs> so that's you know this is a concern is the kind of practices that large scale requires. That's the problem. Would you look at which of those three crops would you look at as the most detrimental to the planet today? Well, the most detrimental is dependent upon the acreage <laughs> that uh, that is required. Uh, corn acreage used to be the worst in terms of soil erosion, but now soybean acreage has more soil erosion than corn acreage, I understand. So it's detrimental predicated upon the scale. So, I'm, I mean, rice, 
rice is pretty bad uh, in, in the sense of uh, the, uh, the greenhouse gases coming off those patties as a contributor to uh, climate change. That's a serious, that's, that's really serious. And uh, they're, they, they don't last as long as the carbon dioxide, but they, uh, they're more potent as trapping the heat. So. How, how are greenhouse gases coming off of rice patties? How does that work? Well, it's a, uh, it's, a it's just the nature of the oh, what is it? Um, oh, I'm trying to think of the the the, the chemical that methane. comes off. Uh, what is it? Methane. Yeah, the well, methane is is, uh, but there's also something else. Methane. Anyway, it's the uh, it's the nature of the of the carbon compound. Okay. Do you see, when, when you look at agriculture the last 50 years and where we are today and then looking in the future, are there, do you see positive changes happening today or are we still just forging ahead and not looking at different practices? Well, I see quite a few positive changes in that there's a growing awareness uh, among the young and some young that have some pretty expensive college educations that decide that they want to they want to have uh, have uh, some small scale arrangement most of those small small scale arrangements are uh, you know vegetables and fruits and so on and I think that's important because there's their emphasis but then you know, I'm from Kansas. I'm from the Midwest. I see the acreage that is in the corn and the soybeans and the sorghum and so on. And what I see there is, uh, you know, now that Roundup is uh, is been so widely spread, I think that's that's a bad thing. And uh, in fact, there was that group of twenty scientists that met in. Um, in Paris, and they said it's a probable cause of cancer. And I know that uh, last year we went pheasant hunting, we saw one pheasant on our property, and just a few quail, and you have to ask why. So I think in terms of the grains, the situation is worse in terms of the, uh, what I call the healthy foods, <laughs> you know, uh, that there, there's, there, it's growing, and so what we need is we really need some huge change in the U.S. Department of Agriculture. That's the commodities people are dictating the terms and so on, and so we're all sort of caught in that. I think too much of farmers are caught in the Stockholm syndrome. Uh, situation where the only way they can survive is to, you know, is to uh, applaud the system that has them caught. <laughs> is is there that balance that that we can achieve where, you know, in this part of the state of Ohio, you're looking at twenty five to thirty thousand dollars an acre for land. Yeah. Um, is there a way you can farm and make a living? But do it in a sustainable way uh, that is actually helping your soil and not losing your topsoil. With you know, if if you're a grass-based area and all you have is is you know perennials, permanent pasture is one thing. But if you're a dairy farmer, it's really hard to make a living with right. the permanent pastures and dairy. Right. Well, uh, I'll tell you why. I'm in Ohio right now, and why I'm in Amish country right now. And my wife and I wanted to bring our grandson, Jacob Miller, who's 22 years old, to see this, uh, the closest example to a sustainable agriculture. And it's, of course, among the Amish uh, right here. And because uh, I think this represents the best standard or example and I see people thriving now I realize that they many of them have other things that they do besides farm but nevertheless um, 
what I see happening is pretty close to what it was when I first came here in 1983, and I saw steep hillside farms with rotations, you know, uh, 16 rows of corn on a steep hillside, then a cover crop, then, you know, corn, and then uh, a care. And uh, I think I even heard uh, willingness to carry the bottom furrow <laughs> from the bop up to the top, I think. Monroe Miller said something like that. So I think the 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 example is there, but this this is uh, due to some cultural practices and a handing down. Well, the industrial mind uh, can't waste it; doesn't think it can waste its time uh, on such farming. I we got minimum till now. We got no till. The minimum till. Uh, meeting is held in Salina, Kansas uh, every year and uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of uh, techniques and so on but you know I can <laughs> I can go around with you know, there's a local farmer friend of mine and look at his fields and uh, you know we're talking about how much money he has spent for the inputs how much he hopes he can get and you know that profits uh, only 25 percent in most cases and uh, that's not paying for the land or for the uh, for the equipment he's just talking about those other inputs so can we i think we're going to need some policy change uh, that is pretty dramatic because right now the scale is just huge. I mean, now it's an ordinary sort of, not even medium, I would say close to small farm. And I'm where there's 28 inches of annual precip precipitation. Some say it's 30. You know, uh, 3,000 acres. Well, <laughs> you know, what is that? That means they're farming a whole bunch of former homesteads. And so the demise of the small town and the rural communities, I think, is uh, Wendell Berry talked about it way back in his 1977 book, The Unsettling of America. And it's unsettling, it's unsettling not only the unsettling, but the unsettling of, of the country. And, uh, you know, some of us uh, think that the last election was a consequence of uh, those uh, patterns uh, that well have been going on since World War II in a big way. I mean, a lot of this, there was depopulation even during the 30s, but it's continued to depopulate. There are now, what, more people in prisons than on farms. And uh, I think that needs to be paid attention to. It's a cultural crisis as well as an ecological crisis. That's Wendell talked about that in his book. And that's I uh, had a chance to talk with one of our Organic Valley members, and he was talking about community. And he said, when you talk about the, you know, a family, five Amish families, horse-drawn power, move in and they'll buy a thousand acres and make five farms out of it. He said, you're you're building a community. He said if there wasn't for the horse-drawn equipment and the horsepower needed to farm that land, it would be one 1,000-acre farm. But he said because of the practices, you are building a community and you're building a small economy because of, basically because of the horse. Yeah, because of the horse. Huh. Yeah. Dad, have you, seen, have you seen changes from when you grew up? <coughs> Uh, you know, Grandpa did the rotations, the four-year rotations and all that. Has there been a shift away from that, even on the small scale? Because we are seeing more and more, you know, the Roundup Ready corn, even in the Amish community. So have you seen uh, a movement away from what Grandpa did? Yes, there has been. We've been farming uh, 50 years now here, and of course I helped Dad for many years before that. And um, we, uh, 
when we started farming up until about from 1968 to 19, close to 2000, we had the annual four or five year rotation where we had wheat followed by hay and maybe hay the second year and then the hay was covered, that old hay field was covered with barn manure and then plowed the, the, in the spring and the corn was planted. Uh, then the next spring the corn uh, stalks were, were plowed for oats and then the oats were then plowed for wheat that fall. So it was this annual annual rotation uh, of crops and that has shifted with I guess the uh, the market demands it because for dairy, for intensive grazing we need more of those fields in, in, in pasture. So in 1997, we dropped wheat from our rotation, but we still have oats, hay, and corn. And But a field would stay in hay for anywhere from three, four, five, six years before it's, again, plowed down, corn planted, oats go in as the oats go in with a cover crop. I'm finding that to grow oats for grain is much more difficult in an organic operation when you have 40 to 50 cows because your, your fertility level is so much higher and the oats tend to lodge. Uh, the oats worked very well in the rotation when you had 10 to 15 cows, 12 brood sows, and a few beef animals and some chickens because you didn't have the high fertility. And uh, where now you know, the oats tend to lodge, then weeds grew up through. So most of the oats are now, the, the seedings are made with oats and maybe uh, oats and peas and with a legume or, a, or a hay seeding and then they're, they're cut for baleage, uh, probably two cuttings, and then uh, it's a hay field or a pasture field. So that is what has changed, and the shift from 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 small square bales to large round bales happened uh, not in, in, in our all well, the very last years of our farming, but we, we never owned a round baler. We had a small square baler. And you, of course, you help Mike and your your siblings and occasional neighbor boy and dad would help as long as he was able. We put away tens of thousands of small square bales every year. That was all dry hay, and I still like that idea of having the hay in the barn. Once it was under roof, no power was needed to feed that hay. You'd, you'd throw the bales down, you'd carry them, you'd open them, and where on the other hand, with large round bales and making excellent quality baleage. You can keep up milk production. Remember, Mike, in the fall, November, I'd ask myself, why in the world am I a dairy farmer? Because you, you, the cows are coming out. We hit, might have had real good pasture yet. It turned cold. They went to dry feed. The production dropped and production dropped and production dropped. And you think, no, it leveled off. It kept dropping. Where today, they can take a round bale. They can put the baleage in and the production stays up. So that is their great advantage today that we didn't have. So that has changed. But overall, the farms have sort of remained the same. The thrasher rings are disappearing. Not much small grains are grown anymore because face it for wheat, we can't compete with a 40-foot combine in Kansas. With a 7-foot cut McCormick during binder, it just literally, no pun intended, doesn't cut it. <laughs> but we have... Uh, uh, so, and again, the price of land, uh, what the consumer, even with this grass, milk, that organic valley, the consumer wants it, we have to supply it, even though we may not particularly like that way of farming, we might have to do it. And so it's, uh, you know, it's the old saying is, you know, times change and we change with time. We need to adjust, we need to adapt, but in a way that, that that's not detrimental to the community. We're constantly, and, and that's why we Amish tend to not have a written, uh, rules or ordnings letter or brief it's called in German because changes are constantly being made if it's not written if it's just oral it's easy to make changes if it's written down it's very difficult to change uh, so that's why uh, we have resisted that uh, because we uh, that, I always say if you if if you write it down you might as well send a, a roll of whiteout tape along with it because it's, things have to change and we like to change as a community, not as individuals. So sometimes, you know, those decisions are very difficult. But we have to have a, uh, a way of farming that farmers can pay their land. And this is happening with organic dairy. The farmers are paying for their farms. They are paying, what, 20,000 acre, 10 to 15,000 acre, and they're paying the farms with dairy, which has been very, very good for us, organic dairy. Of course, a lot changed too. We have no more chicken flocks. We have almost no brood sows anymore, no turkeys. Everything has come down to the dairy cow. And I thought, 
This is conventional dairy. It'll never replace the family farm, but I think they will. These huge dairies, these CAFOs, they have got everything figured down to such a science. Their hauling rates are cheaper. Their feed is cheaper. They've got everything to their advantage, it seems, and the small farms can't compete. And it's really, really sad. As Wes said, we need some policy changes somewhere. There were 1,725 dairy farms that sold out in 2016 in the U.S. And we have more cows now than we did then. Yeah. So the big mega farms are scarfing up the small farms because right now they're expanding because the cows are so cheap. And that's, I feel for the small farm, like in this region or in northern Indiana, Brian, there has to be, you can't compete head to head with that. You have to find yourself a different market and differentiate yourself from that in order to have, if, if you're picking up five semi loads from one farm, look at the, the cost on hauling that milk versus having 25 stops on one route to fill a truck in this area. So we have to have a different product because we can't go head to head with that. Mm -hmm. And with these big farms, you know, I, I cover Michigan as well. And, you know, there are several areas that are, and I'm sure you got it here in Ohio, where there are still, with the low milk price, there are still barns being built to add cows. Oh, yeah. And I think it's partially the banks are so far in with these big farms that they they can't afford to let them go out of business. So there's not going to be any change until something happens higher up than that. Well, I was thinking, J J uh, I hear that in uh, Manhattan, Kansas today, it's, uh, what, already 108 degrees. And I think out in western Kansas, where the facilities are air-conditioned for those 15,000 cows, that are producing milk that I understand goes to Los Angeles. You wonder, you know, what's going to be the air conditioning, the energy cost on that, especially if when the time comes in which we're forced into rationing uh, highly dense carbon, uh, the oil, the natural gas, the coal, and so on. The world is the world is going to be flipping. <laughs> And we'll either bring it on by choice policy or it'll come on by uh, the limits. Do you see a, a sustainable uh, alternative energy? Is there enough being done right now to find that? Well, if actually, the, I've been hearing some mighty positive things about what's going on in Germany that has made a commitment to uh, being to to going off fossil fuels, and uh, you know it's interesting that they're the ones that are taking the lead in this, and there's some other countries in Europe that are doing it. A lot of solar collectors going up, and a lot of wind machines out our way. Um, I'm still agnostic about, say, I'll just take wind machines, for example, uh, when you consider the embodied energy costs for their construction, whether you end up with a positive or a negative energy balance. Uh, no, <laughs> one of the things that I've been thinking about uh, quite a bit lately, well, we did, we had a 10-year sunshine farm study where we looked at the energy costs going into, we had two five-year rotations. And as I mentioned, we had the draft animals and we had the biodiesel tractor. And we looked at the energy cost even for mining the ore in the Minnesota Iron Range to build the tractor and processing in Gary, Indiana, and so on. And uh, I have some serious doubts uh, of how much of the uh, so-called renewable energy uh, that the unacknowledged embodied energy going into it, uh, whether it's going to end up with a, a, a balance. And in fact, I've, in a few um, talks that I've given about this subject, um, I think of... Uh, um, uh, Gary Snyder's poem 
uh, for the children where he talks about the hills of statistics go up, up, up <laughs> on in a, you know, population, resource depletion, pollution, and so on. And, uh, and he says, you know, we'll meet on the other side. And then he says, until then, my children, my advice to you, stay together. That implies community. Learn the flowers. Go light. Well, I've thought about it because here is the Land Institute out to perennialize the major crops and domesticate the wild species and uh, domesticate some wild species. And we have our pickup trucks. We got a fancy greenhouse. We got some fancy labs. We got some, we are contributing to those rising hills of statistics. So then the question is, when these new varieties, these new species are there, will they de require what brought them into existence? And I say the answer is no, that their creatureliness will make them available even to you know, a very primitive farmer. The industrial world can't say that about its uh, technology. And so, you know, you have the, the, you have the ecology that is associated with the creatures and you don't have that kind of opportunity for feedback loops and so on in the industrial world. So we're going to have a whole bunch of new thinking that's going to be required <laughs> of us. And I think it's important for us in our time to be mindful that what may appear to be for a particular moment some kind of a solution, whether it's you know the wind machines or the solar collectors. We don't know. But we ought to be at least critiquing, you know, what is the energy cost for that? So, What are your thoughts on ethanol? Well, I think it is a bad idea uh, that we should, that carbon is more important in the soil than in the gas tank. And uh, many years ago, we did a study when... Uh, uh, this was the Carter years, and they were going to have um, farmers were going to turn their crops because the crops weren't bringing much, and so they'll turn it into ethanol. They wanted to turn their grain into ethanol. We had farmers come to us and say that they wanted to do that, and I said, "Look, boys, you don't want to do it. They get rid of those subsidies; those stills are going to rust." And out. So anyway, we did a study. At that time, we had corn averaging 100 million acres, 100, uh, 100 uh, bushel an acre. We had um, we had uh, 70 million acres of corn. So we assumed a solar still. We assumed it would operate at the top theoretical efficiency. We assume that the spent mesh that's left over, which is high in protein, we could give that an energy credit equal to the amount of energy to grow, required to grow an equivalent amount of protein in the soybean, in the soybean crop. In other words, we were wanting to assume the best of all possible worlds. Well, not 70 million acres. Oh, and they just wanted to meet on-farm traction needs. So in order to meet on-farm traction needs, not 70 million acres of corn, but 117. <laughs> and that was, that, that's nothing for livestock, nothing for people. But if we change the load factor in the American automobile from 2.2 people per passenger mile to 2.4, we have an energy savings equal to 117 million acres of corn. So it's nuts. <laughs> it's just nuts. And it wouldn't happen if it hadn't had the drive that comes from 
those of us that are the those that are the equivalent of the Symbionese Liberation Army at the time of Patty Hearst when she was captured by him and had to be bailed out by her daddy on the grounds that it's a Stockholm syndrome. I mean, I think that we are so caught within the system that in order to survive, we've got to be praising that system. That's the way Patty stayed alive. She changed her name from Patty to Tanya and was carrying the rifle. You know, and we we're caught somehow. We don't, and it's unacknowledged. Now, to a certain extent, we're all caught within the Stockholm Syndrome to a, to a certain extent. Uh, but um, I think that we got to have more and more people say, you know, we are tired of being captives. And that's what we are, captives. So there's, I mean, you're doing your part to say you're not a captive. What can people that aren't, you know, founding the Land Institute or something like that, well, what I'm, can they do? I'm, I'm still a captive. I'm just pounding the walls uh, <laughs> in my house arrest situation. I mean, we're just under house arrest, you know. I mean, they allow us to have our own house and so on. <laughs> Uh, so the, the question of what of what are what, what can, can we others do? do? Well, this is of course the question my kids used to ask me at the dinner table. And uh, so, Doctor Doom, what can we as ordinary citizens do about <laughs> this? You know, <laughs> I think the most important thing is to start with asking some questions that go beyond the available answers. Uh, that can help drive some knowledge out of the categories. But, for instance, um, what would it be like if we were to put a cap on the mines, the wellheads, the port of entry, and the forest? We're not going to say no to all, but it's going to be so much this year. And we're going to have rationing. And it's going to be so much next year. And it's going to be so much the next year. I mean, we had rationing. I remember rationing in World War II. I mean, I remember going to Sunday school, a sign along the road to save tires, drive under 35. I remember the coupons, you know, that you can only get so much sugar at the grocery store. We still have a few of those in my, des in my dad's old desk. Uh -huh. <laughs> But at so, that point, there was a, a cause that people were behind in the yeah. war. What is the cause that can happen yeah. now well, that people can get behind that? They will actually accept that rationing because if there's no yeah. cause behind it, there will be revolt, I think. Well, uh, yeah, and in, you know, there is that cause. You're exactly right. I mean, uh, uh, there were signs up that said, when you drive alone, you drive with Hitler. <laughs> And, uh, Jeez. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, I mean, there was, there it was. You sure. know? I think it's, a sign like that might really push some change right now if you put some of those up. <laughs> yeah, no, I think part of it is uh, the need for a growing consciousness about limits. We need to acknowledge limits, and uh, right now it seems as there are none. And um, from my point of view, we've got to start saying out loud about the necessity and economic growth. Uh, and how would you meet bona fide human needs without growth? I mean, growth is a late thing that's come to humanity. You know, this is a, a recent phenomenon, and yet there's not a single politician that's going to say, you know, we gotta, we got to end growth. So I think we got to start saying some things that are, uh, and this isn't the first time humans have had have had to do this. You know, there there was a reformation. There have been some revolutions. There have been changes. There are changes that have happened rather fast. And uh, and at the time they were said, of course, it was considered a certain kind of blasphemy. You know, to say them. But we got to recognize the limits, and uh, and that's where education, 
conversations, I think in churches and wherever. How would we meet our needs if we didn't have as much coal, oil, and natural gas? You know, I think this is this is could be our undoing. You know, could be, and this again is one reason that I'm in Ohio, and I'm bringing a 22-year-old grandson. And uh, we're going to be thinking about these arrangements. And they're primarily cultural. They're primarily a cultural. And what is it? It's uh, the Land Institute's uh, mission statement goes like this. When people, land, and community are as one, all prosper. When regarded as competing agents, all suffer. Land suffers, people suffers, and the community suffers. Now, some have said, well, what's that have to do with your breeding work to develop perennial grains? <laughs> you know, well, in a sense, it's a derivative of a worldview. And it's a, it's, it's, and uh, now that I'm no longer doing any of the science, you know, we're looking into the 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 our ecosphere that we tend to regard as uh, you know whether it's the atmosphere or whether it's the lithosphere uh, or whether it's the um, hydrosphere as sort of nothing but <laughs> and so then we'll dump gases into the atmosphere and we'll dump poisons into our oceans and we'll do you know all these things because we don't see the earth as a whole <laughs> you know nurturer you know so essentially everybody needs to read and take to heart the land ethic is essentially yeah, what you're saying yeah Aldo Leopold's land ethic I don't think can be beat mm -hmm. he he had been thinking about that for years it is so so profound I mean uh, everything from Odyssey to thinking like a mountain to buttress the land ethic but I, I think yeah we're that's and that's what 1948 <laughs> you know it's been around a while mm -hmm. you know it isn't as though but the literacy about where we are <laughs> is pretty poor they're just you don't get it and now uh, there's a book now about no child left out of the woods or something like that where they're trying to get kids outside but kids are are not out there you know and so getting people to connect I mean reading David's uh, uh, last book and looking at that um, you know daily account and what it's loaded with the engagement with the animals and the atmosphere and the water and the temperature and and the neighborliness and so on there's the there's the prototype for a day in a life <laughs> for 365 days i mean this is the i think this is what we've got to come to rather than robots and stuff flying around above us to take pictures and you know I mean I still use a non-electric typewriter but it's not quite fair of me because I then give it to my secretary after I have you know done some editing on it but what it does is keep me off of you know the temptation to respond right away to somebody sending me an email or whatever. In other words, put some time between you and and the <laughs> and what's required. You know. But our society right now wants instant gratification. Everything is instant. You know, it's 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 got to move like that. And and I think sometimes if we would just take a step back and look at what's happening. I see that with my kids, and I'm I get caught up in it as well. But I think if if we can get people 
to step back and look at the beauty that the world has to offer mm -hmm. and not look at it through a computer screen or through your phone. Yeah. Um, I think that would be one step in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. And that requires, you know, that requires parenting. <laughs> yeah. Instead of surrendering to the kids, parenting. You know, and that's... Yeah, but their mom and dad let their kids do it. Yeah, yeah. I don't you know. care. <laughs> well, you know, I, one night about midnight, I just got home and I came. Uh, I was I heard a big thump, and I thought, oh boy, somebody's some kids have hit the mailbox again. And so I jumped in the car and I managed to run them down. I got their tag numbers and got them and made them come out and so on and so I said look I don't want to, you guys to go to jail but you know why would you do this and one boy said well my dad he, he did it when he was a kid <laughs> and so I was supposed to just surrender I guess <laughs> there's nothing to do and so it, it does have a lot to do with the parents I mean we've got we got poor parenting this, I just like it a little bit. We were talking about time. Oh, many years ago, Maury Tallene sent me a book by Neil Postman, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Oh, yeah. And I just picked this up again. I read it years ago and made some notes, but he's quoting Lewis Mumford here, uh, his great book, The Techniques and Civilization. <clears throat> and he goes on, beginning in the 14th century, the clock made us into timekeepers, and then time savers, and now time servers. In the process, we have learned a reverence toward the sun and the seasons. For in the world, made up of seconds and minutes, the authority of nature is superseded. Indeed, as Mumford points out, the invention of the clock, eternity, ceased to serve as a measure and focus of human events. And thus, though few would have imagined the connection, the ticking of the clock may have done more to do has had more to do with the weakening of God's supremacy than all the work produced by the philosophers of the Enlightenment. Uh, that is to say, the clock introduced a new form of conversation between man and God, in which God appears to have been the loser. Perhaps Moses should have included another commandment, thou shalt not make mechanical representations of time. <laughs> ah. Uh, yeah. This gave me, and even this was written in, probably in the mid '80s, in 1984, yeah. '85. But you know what? We're so much more time conscious yeah. now than even in 1985. Yeah. Well, and, I I understand that even across the United States, that each town's time was predicated on solar time. In other words, uh, and that had to stop that when they started having. Trains. Trains change that. Yeah, because you could. I mean, that it's it's three minutes yeah. later, you know, yeah. or three minutes earlier, I that's, guess, that's, as you're going west. That's when standard time came in. Yeah, you have to get a standardization. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm probably one of the worst people when it comes to that. I mean, I, I suppose because I taught. You have class that begins and class that ends and so on. Oh, yeah, too. As a minister of preaching, you're very aware of the clock, very, very aware of the clock. Yeah. That it goes too fast or too slow? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that it is, it, we have a little minister's handbook that was written in the late 1800s by two ministers in Iowa. Yeah. And he said sometimes you hear the remark, it would have been a good sermon if he only had known when to quit. Yeah. <laughs> so we've gotten into time and we've gotten into parenting. I guess let's go back to agriculture a little oh, yeah. bit. Details. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've talked about policy change. Um, what other things can push agriculture in the right direction? What other things can push it? Well, you know, uh, our friend, uh, Wendell Berry. Uh, our mutual friend Wendell Berry is has taken it up on himself to um, attack the mania about climate change. Now Wendell's not doubting 
that climate change is a reality. But what is, and this is something of my interpretation, and I did tell him my interpretation of him, because I have to explain <laughs> to a lot of people, uh, or I've been asked to anyway. Here's what Wendell is saying. We ignore soil erosion. We've ignored the fossil fuel dependency. We've ignored the chemical contamination of the land and water. We've ignored the demise of the small towns and rural communities. Maybe people get behind climate change because, by golly, here is now a problem that is deserving of my attention. These others don't deserve my attention. Uh, they're not big enough, or they're not popular enough, or they're not whatever. Now, I think that's an important point. And sure, we, I believe that climate change probably does sum our problem best. I mean, I was looking at some, or hearing some data the other day by, you know, uh, 2250. Uh, you know, uh, it's going to be, well, well, no, 500 years from now, sea level, 200 feet higher. By 2250, the hottest in uh, 420 million years. So, you know, this is a different time than what we've known. But, it all has to do, I think, with events that that started perhaps with the Enlightenment. You could say that it's before that, of course, but you know, something happened there in the Enlightenment, and uh, <clears throat> and they that kind of rationalization then paved the way for 1750 in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and you know. England, um, England, which really got us going on that, although that started with water power, but very quickly went to uh, the coal. Uh, that gave us a different world, a different world than what our ancestors had been working through. And now the paradox is there's a whole bunch of wonderful things that have been discovered in that period that we would not have discovered <laughs> otherwise and that I'm glad to know. Mm -hmm. uh, but boy, the cost. And uh, was it worth it? Well, I think it all depends on what we do from here. <laughs> you know, If we don't get involved in more restoration and responsible. So it comes back, I think, this the, the 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 community part, I think, is one reason it is so gone and so perverted where it is present, whether it's the golf course or the bowling or the whatever, and uh, or the playing with the the gadgets. Um, I think that it's possible. I mean, if there's anything that the uh, the, the Amish and the Mennonites have shown, that uh, that community uh, can be a satisfying life, and uh, with less social consequences. Well, one of the undeveloped theories I've had is that. You know, as we've gotten away from community, yeah, um, which is you know we try to isolate ourselves as much as possible. It seems we've gotten into that type of thinking and gotten away from knowing your neighbor and getting help from your neighbor. Now you have, you know, let's just take the current political climate. You got either you're a strong conservative or you're a liberal, and they hate each other, but yeah. they're a part of a community. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is happening is, uh, you know, it's a community and that's what's missing. And that's what, when I get into and work with the Amish and Mennonite communities, I really admire is that, you know, you guys don't care, liberal, conservative, it doesn't matter because you have your community. You don't need to find another community that to be a part of. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, then that, and I would say uh, what goes with it is scale. That there's something uh, wrong with uh, a huge scale that is beyond your comprehension, whether it's looking at a piece of land or whatever. Uh, uh, as soon as that scale goes up, then there's a certain imperative that comes over you that requires then a neglect of some ordinary human virtues. Uh, and where that is, you know, I think, you know, I think quite a bit about Native Americans. Um, I don't know how well I would have been as a Native American. Uh, but one thing, you know, one thing about, there was a tribe. There was a tribe. And there was not just one chief. You know, there were chiefs, you know. And there was deliberation before the campfire and so on. And, uh, and that, uh, you, you didn't have one big chief that was over millions of Indians. You know, you had it was a scale thing on the size of the community. So uh, scale, I think. Well, Schumacher said it, and small is beautiful. Uh, economics as if people mattered. Uh, he said that uh, that uh, that people are small. <laughs> you know, and that uh, smallness is far more beautiful than, you know, the big grandeur. Uh, I think there's, once you get scale, then the next thing you know, you're thinking about power. <laughs> and once you start thinking about power, phew, there's another lift. You know, Wendell Berry said that if Jefferson had been designing the national capital. It would not have been the capital that we got. It would have been more like something about Williamsburg. In other words, there had been a more modest placement on the landscape that would serve symbolically far better than the grandiosity that's suggested by that national capital. Well, where does that come from? That comes right out of the king era, you know, and it comes out of the big church era and all those things that eventually had a certain bankruptcy in uh, coherence and so on. So, I mean, I think everything from our art to our music to our, uh, to our buildings has got to be rethought, rethought. And 81-year-old people ought to have a limit on the amount of senile rapture they're allowed at any <laughs> There should be a cap on it. Now. There ought to be a cap on senile raptureness. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, that senile rapture, you know. <laughs> Ooh, and you're given a license because you happen to be the oldest one around. This is the thing I've noticed. The scientists don't stand up to me in the way that, you know, that, well, you know, he's going to be gone here before long. And, and, and uh, also, you know, <laughs> and uh, what's it going to hurt? You know, he's not affecting our funding. <laughs> you know, but... The, the importance of uh, being taken seriously, I think engagement is important. You know, we've got to get these so many things thought through. So, appreciate what Organic Valley does. That's a, that's a, you know, that is a very positive, uh, and I understand growing. And so, that's pretty good. <laughs> it is it is really rewarding to see that what we're doing is working for the small farm uh -huh. when you see how many 
of the next generation are taking over the, the family farm. Yeah. We see that because if it wasn't working, the kids wouldn't want to have, be a part of it. Yeah. So that, that is a really rewarding part of my job yeah. is to see that next generation take an interest in Good. it. Yeah. And the younger generation seems to be much more open to the thought of organic farming than the older generation that's out of debt. Yeah. They don't have to, they're out of debt, they kind of have it made, but yeah. the young generation sees that if they want to survive yeah. and be able to afford the farm, they're going to have to look at some alternatives. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, I want to thank both of you very much for sitting down mm -hmm. with us. And Dad, do you want to talk a little bit about your book that's coming out in August? Oh, this is called the uh, the Round of a Country Year. It was written over a little bit over a year, not much, and uh, I was asked to do it by a friend of mine, and then of course uh, uh, he didn't get it done. He his publishing business folded for a while. He's back in business again. So I I I gave it to Jack Shoemaker at Counterpoint Press, and he he S snapped he, it up. He he did. I was surprised, and so it was written over a year, and and just what. I don't know. I always wanted to write a book from start to finish. <clears throat> Excuse me. The rest of my books were just collected essays, and so this is it. And even even so, I I did again. <clears throat> I'm not quite your age, but still, I repeat myself. <laughs> <laughs> so if you see repetitions, is so he, he's getting up in years. <laughs> uh, I don't uh, think so. <clears throat> no, I think it's a real contribution, David. Well, well thank what, you, Wes. Little I've read of it already. Wes, and, Wendell was very generous. He went through it, did the first editing on it, and also wrote a preface for it. People need to know this stuff. Yeah. And we, as I say, we we uh, we live a good life here, and we have a lot of happy young farmers that are doing well. And it's been very, very, very uh, rewarding to see there. Um, as Joel Salatin wrote years ago, to have a truly sustainable agriculture, we need to make we need to romance the young people in the farming. He's, I think he worded it. And for that to happen, we we need three things. One is we have to make a profit. Uh, the other is it we cannot be overwhelmed by work all the time. And the third one was it has to be fun. He called it fun. I called it enjoyable. And that is a way of life that, that we really we really cherish and we, we really like it. Well, you know, I, I don't know if you know that book. Uh, uh, the wheelwright shop. Yes, I have it. Yes. Well, the kind of pleasure and engagement that those people had as they were doing their art, and uh, the wheelwright guy that had inherited the shop said that in those days, the early days, that they put in eight hours, but then now or later, you know, eight hours was considered, you know, tedious or hiring or whatever and it had to do with the nature of your engagement with the work <laughs> that if you uh, and I've thought a lot about what it means to, for people to say thank God it's Friday <laughs> boy that's a sad statement it sure or is. that Wednesday is the hump you get over the hump or how you doing this morning on a Monday well it's Monday well what's that saying yeah about what what do you no wonder you know no wonder we yeah have. you know my brother my next oldest brother is also a minister and and he preached one time he said he read that 80 percent of the people in this nation don't enjoy the work they're doing they're just doing it for a job and he had left the farm and his son was farming the farm and he was working in a palace shop and he said right now i'm one of those 80 percent because he was not enjoying the work he was doing he left a farm. So yeah. that's really sad. Why not do something you really like to do? Sure. Why, you know, not wait until you're 65 to yeah. then pursue your interests. Do it all, all your life. Right. All right. Well, Wes, uh, do you want to talk a little about, you said, the Prairie Festival? Oh, yeah, the Prairie Festival is the last full weekend in September. I don't know what that date is. But uh, it starts on a Friday evening and quits at Sunday noon. Um, that would be the 29th, 30th, and then the first, you no, said, of September? Yeah, but no, That's, because that picks up 
the first. You got to go back a week. Yeah. Okay, so it would be the twenty second, twenty third, and twenty fourth right, of September. Right, right. And that is at the Land Institute. At the Land Institute in our barn. Okay. And uh, it's an intellectual hootin' nanny. <laughs> <laughs> is it open to the public? It's open to the public, and uh, it costs. We charge people, mm-hmm. but we bring in lots of speakers, and we'll serve some of our bison and. Uh, you know, there's music, there's poetry, there's some art, there's just a lot of people walking around in a convivial sort of way. You had your dad there, uh, and I don't know, many years ago now. If I were still president, I'd have him back again. Uh, but it's, um, you know, Wendell was there, I don't know, 11, 1,200 people come. Uh, Usually around six hundred or six hundred to to a thousand. It all depends a lot on the speakers, and we've had some pretty good ones. Who uh, was who is on this year? Uh, I don't know, uh, except that Catherine Sneed is going to be there. I suggested her. She works in the prison in San Francisco and has prisoners doing gardening. And she's been doing this for, I don't know, 20-some years. And uh, uh, she uh, the she just has a tremendous story to tell about what it does to their spirits uh, to be able to be gardeners. And these are from the murders to the drug addicts to whatever. Mm-hmm. Can you find out more uh, information on the festival on your website? I yes, if it's there. I okay. mean, if they if they know, uh, okay. it's time that we really line that up. It is <laughs> August coming up. It's on the Land Institute website. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Jake. See, he knows these things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that sounds like something I want to go to. Sometime. Oh well. I'm glad to know that you want to go to that, and I will be telling somebody that, and maybe there even making go. a suggestion. Yeah, oh, yeah, sounds interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for being here. This was incredibly enjoyable, and I, I feel honored to sit down with two of the three remaining five fearless <laughs> horsemen. Or I'm not sure how you can call you guys, but. Uh, Thank you so much for, well, for taking you. the time. Well, yeah, thank thanks you, a lot. Well, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.